Heavy Cardboard, Episode 90, Kalimala. Coming to you from Post Spiel, pre BGG Con HCHQ. Wow, that's a lot of letters <laughs> in Chile, Denver, Colorado. Welcome to Heavy Cardboard, where we talk medium and heavy strategy board games, war games, 18xx, and other related topics in the board gaming hobby. We're your hosts. I'm Edward. And I'm Amanda. So the patron drive was successful. It really was. It was so nerve wracking on Saturday, just like having a tally of, okay, we have $40 to go. We have $30 to go. We have, it was, it was, Crazy and awesome all at the same time. It really was. I mean, I had no expectations going into it. My my only hope, so I guess we can kind of lay out exactly what we were thinking here, was we needed, like, it would have been a colossal failure if we didn't get to $3,200 a month. It right. would have been a total waste of about eight to 10 weeks worth of work between us as well as those that helped out behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. And thankfully, that uh, that didn't happen, or I should say that was a non-concern, I think might yeah, be a that, good way that, to put it. Yeah, it was a non-concern, yeah. I, I really had no expectations of it, just I was hoping that it would be at least that high. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so wow, thank you. Everybody that is now a patron, there are 591 patrons as wow. of the time of us recording this which actually is recording on thursday mm-hmm. due to well things happening and trying to get onto kilter from yes. everything but yeah just it's so insane to think that we call it the 138 box because we had 138 patrons when we moved up to the studio and now we have 591 yeah it's it's crazy like like i said i didn't have any expectations so we couldn't have surpassed it but it still feels like it did because at the beginning you said oh we're gonna get you full time Mm -hmm. before the end of the drive and i was like i love you and i appreciate that the the positive vibes but it's just not realistic i didn't feel like because the highest we had ever gotten previously in a single month was I want to say it was about four hundred and thirty dollars in new patron mm-hmm. new patron pledges, et cetera, et cetera, uh, a month. And this we we started out at twenty three and change. We needed to get to forty one and change. And mm-hmm. I was like, so for more than quadruple what we've gotten in any other single month prior. And I said, yeah. And I was like, yeah, no. You know what? If at the end. You're right. I will be like, you know what? You were right. I was wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, Amanda, you were right. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just glad I was right and that you were wrong. I, I, yeah, just seriously, this is amazing to me. It still hasn't sunk in that, okay, hey, this is now officially my job. Right. This is like, what do you do for a living? I, I, I. I run a podcast and YouTube channel. Yep, you do, sir. That's surreal. And I don't think I'm going to get used to that for a while, but I also think that's a good thing. Yeah, I do too. I don't think you should get used to it, at least for a while. Right. All right. So what all does this mean? Well, uh, a number of things. First off, we have a Duchess table, board game table to give away. uh, Thanks to Mm boardgametables.com. That's going to take place on Saturday. So just under 48 hours from now. All $5 and up patrons get entered in the drawing. And if your name gets drawn, guess what? You win a free table. That's right. The caveat here or the the condition Mm -hmm. is if you're in the US, Canada, or the EU, everything's paid for. Like, congrats. You win a new table. It'll come. I think Chad told us it'll either be January or February is when he's able to fulfill that. But you get a... Totally tricked tricked out out table for uh, free. Game table. The only thing it will not have is the topper. However, if you are outside of those three zones, you can still win and you can still have a free table. However, you got to pay the shipping and I don't know what that'll be. So yeah. we'll we'll cross that bridge if and when mm-hmm. it comes to where we'll leave it up to the person that won if they want to do that. If not, then we will draw somebody else and maybe we'll give them, you know, uh, a consolation gift prize of yeah, some kind. consolation prize of something. We'll figure that out. So the next milestone on the patron drive is upgraded equipment. What does that mean? Well, when we kind of envisioned what this studio was going to be, it was actually going to have a second studio in here Mm -hmm. within the same room. 
And we haven't been able to do that yet. And so once we hit that goal, we'll be able to finish the studio, uh, which is kind of a uh, in front of a TV slot or and or fireplace, you, you know, uh, kind of a more casual mm-hmm. area instead of always around the game table and everything. Uh, we'll be using that both for the podcast as well as for video. So both sides would benefit from that. And then eventually... Hopefully. Me full time. Yep. That's the that's the final goal that we have as of right now, which is we're over halfway there yeah. right now. But I, I'm kind of like you. I feel like that it's kind of a pie in the sky dream for me. Um, I just, I don't know. Have we reached critical mass? Like, yeah, I, I don't I, know. I, you we'll know. We'll find out as yeah. we go along. So I imagine that the Patreon now is just a slow, steady climb mm-hmm. to that. Question mark. I right. Mean, Who knows? When we when we had Aldi on, he talked about how how much the hobby is growing, how big BGG is growing, so on and so mm-hmm. forth. So for every month, all these new people are coming into the hobby. Not everyone is going to be a heavy cardboard fan, obviously. Right. However, as that grows, more and more people will get turned on to the show mm-hmm. and hopefully enjoy it and maybe become patrons yeah. and eventually get to where. Wow, we actually can be a lot less stressed yeah. because you currently have two full-time jobs. I do. And thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm very tired all the time. <laughs> so content-wise, the plan now is there's just going to be no decrease in content, both in quantity and quality. So we're planning on three to five playthroughs and or live streams a week, whether it's conversations with Heavy Cardboard or Ask the Elephants Mm -hmm. or any other stuff for live stream stuff. We're obviously going to continue with the occasional exception, the weekly podcast, so Mm -hmm. every Thursday, and one to two other pieces of content for the podcast each week. That's going to vary. It's it, just like the uh, the live streams are going to vary as to what they are. They're not always playthroughs. Um, so those will vary. And, and patrons will have a say on it and will have a say yeah. on that, as well as just the public in general, what you guys are enjoying mm-hmm. and what you're not. But just because the drive is over, like I said, the Patreon lives in perpetuity. So lots of perks to become a patron, whether it's an annual patron or a monthly patron through Patreon. PledgeHC.com is going to remain this, the landing mm-hmm. page for that, and you can choose how you wish to support the show if you choose to support the show in that way. And if you don't, you know, if you don't want to support us that way, then we have a really cool tricked out store with a whole bunch of stuff that you can grab. And yep, that all helps spread the yeah. word, helps uh, posting about it, you know, talking about the show, or whether it's with your local group, whoever. But yeah, just I'm just blown away at yeah. this. So thank you, everybody, for coming together as a community and just celebrating what it is and supporting what it is that we all enjoy about this heavy cardboard thing that we all are a part of. Mm -hmm. It's not just me and Amanda and Matt and Brian and Ash and everybody else. It's all about y'all as well. Speaking of which, I want to give a really special shout out to some folks that have worked behind the scenes to help put the patron drive together, who literally without them, yeah. we could not have done it. It was just way too much. There's no to way do. we could have done it. And they're they're continuing to help us with other things as well. And they have they are invaluable friends to, yes. the, to us. So big shout out to Dan, Jared, Matthew, Ash, Bev, Brad, Matt. And Rob. Yes. Thanks, y'all. Seriously. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, so, so much, guys. So switching gears, the S in Hall is officially, well, hauled. Yeah, it's hauled. Right? It's, it's, good, it's good and hauled. All, all the boxes have arrived. I did three different unboxing slash haul videos for them. Lots of games which means lots of work, but yay, lots of gaming. So Mm -hmm. I cannot wait to dig into these. I'm really, really stoked. so much fun. And now that Essen has come and gone, it's time to gear up for BGGCon, or at least in my case. Yep, you will be by yourself for the first time at BGGCon because I do not have enough time off of work. So I'll be holding down the head, the... HCHQ Fort, along with Customs Official Asher Pants and Dana and Matt. <laughs> and we will be hanging out here while you are in Dallas. Working. Remember, no fun. It will all be fun. It'll yeah. all be work. It'll- sure. <laughs> I've been to BGGCon. I know what's up. 
Speaking of which, our meetup is going to be from seven or at seven p.m. on uh, Thursday until basically the end of the night. So it's going to start at the bar like it did last year, and then head upstairs to rooms eleven oh nine, eleven ten, and eleven thirteen for gaming. So figure we'll hang out, maybe have dinner, or at least have a drink down mm-hmm. there and kind of kibitz and hang out. That's what we did last year and then went up to the and rooms then, and yeah. played. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So starting at 7 p.m. on Thursday, we'll be down at the bar, then head upstairs for gaming. I'll be gaming all night. Well, till late. How's right. that? All right. <laughs> And with BGG Con around the corner, that means Thanksgiving is around the corner, which means Christmas is around the corner, which means... Secret Santa. And the sign-up for that ends next week. If uh, You need to head over to our guild, which is guild number 2044, if you want to sign up. Last I heard, a couple days ago, we were up to 75 folks nice. entered, which is pretty cool. Um, so there are, there are definitely some advantages mm-hmm. for our, give, or our uh, secret Santa slash secret elephant. Game Surplus has offered up a code, Asher makes me smile, all <laughs> one word. That code is active once targets are assigned and will be good through December 23rd. You have to prove... Uh, You have to provide proof of participation in the secret elephant, but uh, it's going to be a 15% off your order. Wow. For anybody that you're, you know, uh, to your target. So it's only good for one use Mm -hmm. for your target. But big thanks to Game Surplus for uh, making that available. And Elaine will kindly gift wrap your item as well, as long as you ask for it, right? Yep. Just write in the note gift wrap for secret elephant please or something along Mm -hmm. those lines and they will uh wrap it in elephant themed holiday paper yeah Yeah, with 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 sid watching over making sure everybody's doing their job correctly right and giving him treats or he will or he will bark at you i'm sure (laughs) now that 15 percent does not stack on top of the 10 percent discount that patrons already get on select games in the heavy cardboard podcast pick section of the game surplus site So just heads up, Mm -hmm. there's no, uh, sometimes they do, in this case they don't, which I can't really blame Carmen with as many orders as I anticipate coming in there. So really awesome of them to to offer that. So Carmen, Elaine, over at gamesurplus.com, thanks a lot, y'all. As always. So other perks. So the aforementioned 10% off discount for all patrons at Game Surplus that just is there in perpetuity. Mm-hmm. So there's that. Also, BoardGameTables.com, if you order a table through them and you send them an email afterwards telling them you're a patron and we verify that you're a patron, you get free poker chip trays added on, the wooden ones like you've seen on the live streams. They'll throw that in. So that's the benefit that's of, cool. of being a patron and ordering a table. As well as 10% off inserts over at Meeple Realty if you use the code HC17. So HC17. Mm-hmm. Uh, so thanks to Meeple Realty for that. Absolutely. Membership has its privileges. <laughs> yes, right? it does. Or I guess community. It's I think a community. Is a good way. This isn't yeah. a membership thing. Right. So I think everybody's pretty much seen what we've acquired recently. Yeah, yeah. Just go look at the three hall videos. I we don't have enough time tonight to list no. every game, and plus that would just be boring when I've already done the hall video. When it's right? more fun, you can watch the watch him unbox everything right? and see boxes and stuff. And um, I also acquired a few things. Oh, did you? Yeah. Um, while we were gone, I acquired two Loic Term notebooks while in Holland, and I got one which I'm already I'm still using my old one, but I'm actually he's actually using, using it, it. Thank God. In fact, I, I used it for my list today. That's Thank fantastic. you very much. And I also acquired about ten pounds. That's less than good. Yeah, well, or less good, I guess. Well, all the, all the food was really good, so I'm okay with it. I bet I think five of it's just fine, Soxa. <laughs> <laughs> and the other five <laughs> is uh, a mix between uh, some cookies. And, and coffee. <laughs> right. All right. That just means what? You just get back on get that back horse, on the horse, right? Or All the right. elephant, as it were. Oh, yeah. So as far as looking forward to playing, well, again, let me reference those The same, hall videos. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, just seriously, all the games, the yeah. OMG. And there's not really any hunting at this point, really. There's one game that I do wish I had picked up uh, to check out that I didn't, that I'm hoping um, somebody might have at BGGCon, and that's a game called Senators. Uh, just a little auction game, little card game. But other than that, I think we're good for a while. <laughs> I hope so. Jeez. All right, so let's dig into the first game of the Essen Hall, Kalimala. Yeah, let's. So Kalimala, obviously published in 2017, designed by Fabio Lopiano, artwork by Harold Lisky of Spielworks fame as well as others. Yes. Published by ADC Blackfire, plays three to five players in about 45 to 75 minutes. As far as availability and cost, there's good news here and there's bad news. The bad news... It's kind of hard to get a copy right now. However, I guarantee that this is going to get picked up uh, and republished or reprinted Mm -hmm. or something along those lines. I have it on good information that that will happen. Oh, yeah. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. when. And I do know that ADC Blackfire does have copies. Now, they are a European distributor, so... We, you can't go buy yeah, one. You can't just order it through there, but there can be stores that can order through there. How many copies they have left, that I don't know, mm-hmm. but it's going to be made available, I assure you. And as far as plays and player counts, I have about seven or eight plays at this point across all the player counts. I have maybe five or so along. I don't think I've played it four, but I played it every other player count. Okay. All right. So what's going on in Kalimala? In Kalimala, players are members of the Art de Kalimala, the Guild of Cloth Finishers and Merchants in Foreign Cloth, one of the most prestigious and influential guilds in Florence, Italy in the late Middle Ages. In the game, players use a clever mechanism to take actions of acquiring resources, converting resources, and and delivering cloth to various cities around Europe in order to score majorities in each of 15 categories. Once everyone has taken all their actions through the game and or all 15 categories have been scored, the game ends. Players then reveal a hidden scoring card, score the majorities on each of the card, whomever has the most victory points at the end, wins. So starting off talking about the five factors that give the game its weight, starting off with complexity. The the rules overhead in this game is minimal. It can be taught very quickly, so... In my mind, it's really not very complex. Yeah, it doesn't add much to the weight no. of the game at all. It's an easy teach, and honestly, it's an easy learn. Mm-hmm. And the game gives a lot of latitude to players. So, for example, players can take actions in any order they choose. There's no hand size for how many cards they can have in hand. There's no limit on how many cards a player can play right. on their turn. Players can play cards before or in between or after their actions. So there's a lot of a lot of flexibility, a lot of latitude, and that just goes to show that there's a low rules overhead mm-hmm. because it just gives you here, just They're go do what you pretty want. Pretty low basically. structure too, because you can just do whatever you want pretty much, whenever you want. Yep. Pretty much. It, the game gives players a really good framework mm-hmm. in which to play, but mm-hmm. lots of freedom with that minimal rules yep. overhead. So yeah, not a lot of weight here from Mm-mm. the complexity. Not at all. All right. What about planning? Well, in planning, while there's some long term planning here, you know, what end game scoring card do you have? What end game scoring card do you think the other players have? Uh, are other players loading up in certain categories, focusing on you know more on this, mm-hmm. and so maybe I'm going to go in this direction or whatnot. It tends to be a lot more tactical and positioning your action desks uh, in favorable positions so that other players get to re-trigger your actions requires a bit of foresight. But other than that, I would say for the most part, tactical. Yeah, it's not very complex, but there are definitely some meaty decisions here, like you mentioned with making sure that you have your tile, your discs placed on the right areas. And because you've seen in many games and even the game we streamed last week, if you didn't, you didn't go where other people wanted to go. So you never got to redo your actions. Yeah. If you don't, uh, position yourself well, you, you pay for that, Mm -hmm. but that's all, but there's that planning. So I think I would say the majority of the weight in this game, like a lot of games that we review, this is where it's going to get its weight from. Yeah. I agree with that. So as far as luck and random factors? 
there's a lot of randomness here. I mean, the in but pregame mostly. Pre, it's all yeah, just about all pregame. So you have all of the scoring tiles. The are, fifteen of them. Those right. are distributed differently every time. The eight worker tiles or action tiles, well, yeah, whatever. Action sure. tiles yep. are those are different every time. Or they're the same ones. They're positioned. They're different, positioned differently right? every time. Yeah. Then you have all of the cards. Which that is the one random factor during the game. Yeah, and that then impacts. And here. then the other one before the game is the the end scoring cards. Right. Uh, what what ones? You get a choice of two or three depending on player, player count. count. Right. And so you know a, a a portion of those are removed from mm-hmm. the game, so you don't ever know. And so it's not like some other games where every single thing you know is going to be scored. You just don't know who's going to score it. In this game, there's multiple cards. So multiple people are going to get, you know, multiple cards and they're going to throw some some of them out. So it's never, it's never going to be the exact same one scored every time. Yep. So on, on the aspect of the random draw of the action cards, I don't feel like it ever imbalanced the game. Like I didn't Mm-mm. feel like you, you or I or anyone else either got punished by the game by not being able to draw the right cards at the right time no it just is inconvenient yeah yeah yeah. it's not it's not a win or win or not win type of situation but it's definitely can be frustrating when you you draw constantly the wrong card we'll touch more on that here in a little bit but overall i would say that not a lot of the weight is going to be added here right no now what about game length I don't feel like it adds to the weight really because it's kind of a short, you know, a shortish game. It yeah. does it does ramp up slowly, but it <sighs> takes off. It does. It's uh I mean it plays in about an hour, give or take fifteen mm-hmm. minutes. So it it feels like the speed in which it should yeah. play in. And kind of like what you said, when you're starting out, you're like, wow, this is going to take forever. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, oh, wow, score, 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 yeah. game end. Yep. Oh, oh, that happened quick. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's a slow burn at first and then it takes off like a rocket. Yep. I think how you put it is exactly right. What about getting it? I think a few rounds and maybe a scoring phase or two and players get it, then it's just a matter of figuring out how to best use your actions and outplay your opponents, I think. What about you? I think it'll only take a couple of times of seeing how the mechanism works of placing your piece on top of someone else's or vice versa just to see how that that's the main mechanic of the game. And I feel of like the re-triggering. Right. Yeah. And I feel like that would need to be experienced at least a couple of times to get the hang of exactly how that works. But I feel like that's the most difficult part of getting it that and the scoring and how that gets triggered and when i think is oh i see the timing Mm -hmm. of that now that type thing right but definitely within the first half of the game i think we're in agreement on that definitely so ultimately the game falls where for you medium for me this is this is the epitome of a midweight euro I could see this be fitting a, a wide swath of players, mm-hmm. heavy gamers, light gamers, everything in between. Heavy gamers, maybe this is your warm up or cool down at a game day. Whereas for a uh, for a lighter gamer, may, maybe this is your your main entree for the game night. Right. I think this fits a lot, checks a lot of boxes. It, I, I think so too, and it also is a good entry level game as well to bring people up from you know maybe the lighter end of the spectrum. Yeah, I think that's that's well put. So moving on to components in the in the cardboard here, uh, I think it's real solid and all, albeit nondescript. Yeah, there's nothing really you know mind blowing one way or the other. It's it's just a good solid game. production. It's yeah. just a good solid production. The the wooden bits are good. The the cardboard's good. The cards are good. Like it's just all. Yep, standard wooden discs, cubes, solid thick tiles for the scoring tiles and action tiles. The player boards are thick cardboard. The cards are a solid corn linen finish. Mm-hmm. So yeah, just solid. Nothing stands out, but that's a good thing here. Like there's nothing to argue or be miffed about with the components. Correct. But the only the only thing that that is kind of special about Kalimala is the special buildings. But there's the deluxe add on pack that gives you 3D buildings for the churches and it has custom plexiglass holders for the for the cubes for the buildings and donated goods to the churches. However, they look great, but literally do nothing for the game. They, in fact, hinder the gameplay. Well, they, they, they can. They, mm-hmm. they make the game prettier. I mean, oh, everybody yeah. likes 3D and they're they're really well done. But if you're playing on the top side of the board, 
They can actually block your view of the goods in the churches. So while I won't tell folks they shouldn't get them, because let's face it, they do look really, mm-hmm. really good. They do. Hank Rollerman had an awesome picture oh, from Spiel, beautiful picture. which is actually the, the picture they use for the background on BGG. Just know that gameplay-wise, they bring literally zero mm-hmm. to the game. So it's not a fear of missing out on these things. No. It's one of those, oh, these look cool. I would like them. Sure. But, oh, am I missing out for an expansion? or No, it's Mm-mm. nothing content-wise. So nope. Just FYI on that. What about the box size? It's just normal, right? Yeah, sort of. It's a standard box size, albeit thinner, which I think thinner is a good thing because mm-hmm. if you stack games vertically like we do, that saves space it on your shelf. <laughs> so it's 12 and a half inches to by just under eight and a half inches by two and a quarter inches thick. So it's it's not thick at all. Uh, so 32 centimeters by 21 and a half by five and a half centimeters. So the graphic design now. I think it's clear and concise and consistent throughout the whole game. I have no complaints at all. Yeah. What something represents in each and every aspect of the game is the same same. symbol across the board. Literally, I I cannot say anything other than it's perfect graphic design. Everything is very, very clear as to what it does. Yep. I would agree with that 100%. Artwork wise, if you're familiar with Harold Leesky's work. It's a normal job by Harold Leesky. It really is. It fits the time period. It fits the game. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It it's fine. Yeah, I, it's it's totally just fine. Mm-hmm. I don't think anyone's going to look at this game and be like, "Oh, look at that." But at the same time, well, okay, maybe if you like super fancy, heavy graphic stuff, this might look a little bland to you. But we like this. Yeah, I like it. I think it's mm-hmm. fine. Yeah. Robot clarity and quality. Found the rule book to be laid out really, really well. Answers every question that we had. Just be sure to read the whole rule book, which really you should do in general. I read the rule book, missed some stuff. In our first live stream, Fabio messaged me and said, hey, you screwed up these two things. I went back and checked the rule book. Yep. (laughs) Clear as day. So that just goes to show that even when we play games multiple times, it's still possible to screw things Mm -hmm. up. That said, it's not the rule book's fault at all here. Uh, the game's simpler rules definitely helps with it being easier to grok. The rule book, I mean. But even so, a very, very well done rule book. Very happy with it. Cool. Right. What about setup and, and teardown, teaching, learning, all that kind of stuff? Well, uh, setup and teardown made really easy with a handful of baggies, which are uh-huh. included in the game. I mean, separate the player colors, two white discs and two workshop tiles into one bag. The scoring tiles and action tiles into their own bags. Cards into their own bag. Boom, you're ready for the next game. And, you know, the funniest part of this game, I will say, is the fact that they give you a little chit that says 50. (laughs) Because the scoring track goes up to Uh 49. Like you're going to get to ever use that. Yeah. uh, The lower player count at three player, maybe. (laughs) At five, good luck with that. (laughs) But as far as teaching, it's really straightforward as well. You do a quick overview of the main board. You go over the player board, which also doubles as a player aid, lists all the available actions. You can teach Mm -hmm. going through that. You go over the available actions on a player's turn and how re-triggering of of player's discs is included in that, how and when a scoring phase is triggered, and then how the game ends and boom, you're ready to rock and roll. Yeah, it's it's not difficult. No, not at all. All right, so what makes the game enjoyable? What do you like about it? All right, so for me, far and away, the number one draw to this game is, and the thing that keeps me enjoying the game after multiple plays is the disc stacking mechanism yep. and the way it works and the way that scoring works hand in hand with it. All right, so to unpack that a little bit. On your action, you're going to place a disc between two of the available action tiles out there, and you're going to do both actions in either order that you wish. And it's real simple. It's get a resource or build something or something like Mm -hmm. that or deliver or whatever or donate. On your turn, you can also play some cards, you know, that allow you to do the exact same actions that I just mentioned. That's neither here nor there. But where the cleverness here comes in 
is on somebody else's turn, if they want to take the same action you did, they can. They stack their disc on top of the existing stack of discs between those two actions, and they take their actions. But then it re-triggers the entire stack of actions down below. So if Amanda goes on top of mine, she gets to take her two actions. Then I get to take my two actions again. Mm -hmm. Unless there's a stack of three already on there. Then the bottom one, the fourth one, when somebody places a fourth disc on top, gets kicked out, and that triggers a scoring. We'll get to that in a second. But then everybody, all three discs, get to take their actions, just like what I just said, and then you get to score. Well, what score? Well, there are 15 different categories, as I mentioned. It's uh, all majorities. They score three, two, and one point, respectively, Mm -hmm. regardless of player count, and the order in which those 15 categories are laid out is that's the part of that randomness that we talked about during the uh, setup. And the cool thing about this on top of all that is each player has two or three white discs and white discs allow you to take double action. So you get to do each action that it's in between twice. However, it does not, the game has no memory, meaning, okay, once you've taken those actions, if somebody places a disc on top of that, you don't get to re-trigger with the white disc it because doesn't no, remember. Right. No but who how are we supposed to know who placed that mm-hmm. white disc there? But if it then gets kicked out as a scoring disc, whoever triggered that scoring gets to take the white disc and replace it with one of their colored ones for the city council, mm-hmm. which is so not only are you triggering scoring, but you're also placing that disc up there, which is tiebreaker, because there's a lot of ties in this yeah. area majority. And that right there is the reason you're going to want to play this game. It's not for the theme. It's for this mechanism and how well it's implemented. It's fascinating and really, really cool. That is my that is my favorite part of the game as well. Oh, yeah. It's, it's the reason why if that does not excite you seeing slash hearing that, then this game's not yeah, going to be pass. for you. Yeah. That's w- absolutely what carries the game through and through. Most definitely. I mean, you can even manipulate that in, in so far as like scoring of areas can be forced with placing that fourth disc. Maybe you want to make sure that you have that majority right now, but then maybe the next turn your opponent will. So you make sure that you put a fourth disc up there to kick out to make a scoring happen. Maybe you weren't really ready for it. Or you're not ready for the next one. Or you're not really super excited about the actions that it gives you to do. But you want those three points and you know you'll get them. So you can, and it also will speed up the game as well. And not only that, but with that, oh, I'm not super excited about these two actions. Well, if you can't ever do one of the two actions. You get to draw cards. You get, exactly. And that allows... Uh, clever use of your actions. So these cards, you as I said earlier in the review, you can play as many of these on your act on your turn as you want, and it's just more of the same actions that are out there on the board, anyways. Of the nine available mm-hmm. actions, however, and this is really really clever as well. Maybe you want to draw a card, but you can't because you can do both actions. But if you do them in a specific order, it makes it so you can no longer perform one of those actions and boom, now you can draw a card. Then possibly immediately play it, which then might allow you to play further cards out of your hand. And that turned in from what was a meh turn into, oh, wow, that was really well done. I did this and then I did this and then I did that and then that happened. And I got to maximize the scoring of being able to do so by forcing that and kicking that out Mm -hmm. so that you know, a scoring happened. I think that, I mean, that's the type of like just clever mechanism that I really enjoy in Mm -hmm. games. And it's one of the things that excites me about this hobby, seeing new, really cool ways to implement new mechanics like this. It's really cool. So the game pace is completely player dependent Mm -hmm. because, because one of the ways the game ends is with 15, all 15 categories scoring. So if all of those are scored, well, that's the end of the game. So if players are scoring a whole lot of things quickly, that can speed up mm-hmm. the pace of the game. Now, granted, we're talking 45 minutes to maybe 75 minutes, so it's not a long game to begin with. But I like that it's completely player controlled. It, yeah, there's no timer at all. It's just like it's not like after five rounds, this will score. Although it, at the end of all of your actions, so if everybody's out of discs, that also triggers the end of yeah, the game. Yeah, but that's but, just an in-game trigger, though. That's not after X amount of rounds something sure, happens. Sure, right. 
trying to figure out what your opponent's in-game scoring areas are good and that you can kind of steal, you know, from steal a couple of points here and there because the scoring is so tight, like we mentioned, and the in-game scoring gives you the most amount of points. So even if you can be, if you feel like, oh, wow, Edward's really focusing on, on Lisbon, maybe I should just throw a couple cubes over there to see if maybe that's his in-game scoring. And if I can mooch three points off of that for two cubes, okay. Yeah, that's, uh, it's as we mentioned, 50 points is a lot of points in this game. Usually in a multi you know, four or five player game, you're looking somewhere in the mid thirties. So mm-hmm. if you can get a couple of points here or there, that really, really does yeah. add up in the end. And on that note of the end game scoring cards, it forces you to pay attention to what other players are doing throughout the entire game. Using their actions to guide your own for higher point scoring can be the difference between winning and losing. I actually, tonight, before we recorded this, I discussed this with Fabio and I asked him, why are the end game scoring cards worth five, three and one versus mm-hmm. three, two and one, which they are during the game, mm-hmm. the scoring tiles. And he said that he wanted to incentivize players to really pay attention to what others are doing for their actions and to try and deduce what other end game scoring, much like Montropolis, Interesting. which is, it, okay, we know all the end game scoring. I mean, they're all right, right. here. There are 10 available options. And so, okay, he's focusing over here or she's focusing Mm -hmm. there. Maybe I should try and be second. But that also leads to some clever bluffing and misdirection. So I like the fact that he took that into account. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're worth more points than just the three, two, one during the game. It makes total sense now that, you know, that now that it's explained like that, it how could you not have it be more points, you know? Yep. The game doesn't overstay its welcome. No, not even a little bit. Uh, Even though you're doing the same thing turn after turn after turn, the turns move very quickly, Mm -hmm. too. So Mm -hmm. it is just whipping around the table. It doesn't... I mean, a little AP here and there can can, can... Slow it, slow it down, but it's so fast paced otherwise that it you'd never really feel like it's dragging or anything. The way the white discs grant double actions immediately, uh, but they give you personally no extra long term benefit, and they might actually help your opponents because every time you put down a white disc, if that gets kicked out as a scoring disc later on, that might your opponent might be able mm-hmm. to take that white disc for a double action yep. and then put one of theirs up there. So you're helping yourself short term while potentially helping either yourself or someone else long term. So I like that kind of balance between short term benefit, long term benefit, mm-hmm. whether your disc or white disc. I also love the variability of the game. You're never going to play the same game twice ever because there's too many different ways to place the action discs or the action tiles out and the scoring tiles out. There's just no way. Yep. there. It's the same game. Don't get me wrong. You're doing the exact same thing, no matter how variable the setup is, but it does change the way the game mm-hmm. plays. It very much does. And it gives the game the legs that it absolutely would need. Yes, I totally agree. Like each space plays the same, but I mean, the way you play and the combinations that can be made, that's what's, that's where it's different yep. every time. The, exactly. The, the combos. Good yep. call on that. Yeah. So this game proves to me that if your main mechanism is really good and really clever, it can absolutely carry a game of this length. Yep. I've wondered whether a single clever mechanism or two as it is uh, interwoven with the stacking of the discs and kicking out Mm -hmm, for the scoring, mm -hmm. whether or not that can carry a game. And to me, it's at least been proven that it can be done. Yeah, definitely. And I'll be honest, if it's not for that action, it's a completely nondescript game that, in my opinion, would never, should have never been made if not for that really, really clever mechanism. I would agree with that. And the game feels original because of that. Is there another game that uses this mechanism? Not that I'm aware of. If y'all know one, let us know, but I don't, I've never seen it before. I haven't either, and that's why it makes it good. Yeah. The action cards could be indispensable when playing because especially if you can get the card you need, but you know, you don't want to either allow the people below your disc to have that action, or you don't want the next area to score yet. Like... You don't want the statues to score yet because you need one more for the majority, but you have a statue action card, so you can play that card, put your final statue up there so that you have the majority, and then cause the scoring. 
to happen. Or, or if you have the major, or you're tied for the majority, and you have the tiebreaker. Same mm-hmm. idea. Yeah, those those cards can really benefit you. And and with having no hand limit, even if you draw a quote unquote useless card now, you might need it later. Thirty minutes from now. You might be like, oh, wow, I can use this whole stack of cards that I thought were just trash cards. Yeah, like in our live stream, I kept getting donation cards, donation cards, and I was getting very irritated. And then, oh, oh, I used them all. Oh, (laughs) oops, sorry about complaining. (laughs) Exactly. Even with this being a very, you know, shorter game with a shorter time frame, there's ma- some very meaty decisions. You wouldn't think of that going in, but there are. I mean, there's a Play lot a of disc, them. Take two actions, right? That's VTOL simple. Yeah, that's, that's right? VTOL simple, but no, it's, it's not. <laughs> All right. So on the flip side, things not to like. All right. So we'll take care of the obvious one. Three to five players, yeah. right? I applaud that they didn't try to shoehorn a player Me count too. that the game isn't designed for. So for that, it's actually kind of a positive, but it doesn't play two player, which some folks aren't going to be interested because, oh, isn't there a two player variant? You know, there might yep. end up being one, Maybe, but, but why? Yeah. There are better two player games. Yep, so. Play a two player game. I mean, this is just a com- a complaint about something that can't be fixed, really, but that is, I mean, you know. It, it's on the downside, right? Yeah. So you and I can't play it on a school night, right. for instance. And it can feel a little samey, you know, over and over and over again doing the same thing, but the game moves so quickly that it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, and it doesn't overstay its welcome uh-uh. or else that sameness would absolutely be an issue, but here it doesn't feel like it. It really doesn't because the game moves so quickly and it's, relatively so short yep i agree so there's no emergent gameplay along with that sameness it's just you're doing placing an action disc taking two actions playing some cards maybe there's a scoring rinse and repeat like you said if if it wasn't for the the disc stacking mechanism and the pushing out and scoring this would i don't know that this would be a game that i would really want to play yeah oh i i absolutely wouldn't if not for that so there's the random draw of the action cards. We've already covered that. Mm-hmm. So even if, a, but on the flip side, especially later, you can truly draw useless cards. Yeah. Because it's just drawing off top of the deck and, oh, sorry, you didn't get that one action you right. wanted. And I got one more. And it kind of, I know it's going to turn some folks off, but I kind of already addressed it when I talked with Fabio. So the end game scoring cards, the fact that they're hidden scoring cards first off, um, it, it, the issue for me isn't that they're hidden. You can always house rule it if you want to where they're open info, mm-hmm. if so inclined. But again, during the game, all the scorings are 3, 2, and 1 points for first, second, and third. And here it's 5, 3, and 1. And so it's definitely weighted towards the back end. And this is all secret information. Mm-hmm. I mean... What that means, though, is you can just maintain to be competitive through the game, correctly deduce others' endgame scoring cards, and do well enough there to sneak a win. Yeah. And I've seen that happen in a number of games. So the game puts emphasis on the players to work at deducing other players' endgame scoring cards, but at the same time, it allows you to use misdirection. However, not everybody is going to be really excited about no, that aspect and, of the game. And I can understand that, but I can also understand that if you know going in that you don't like doing that type of thing, then have them out for everybody to see. Yeah, have but more it, than one for every, each player. it also removes that aspect of the game. So I guess if you don't like that aspect, you could do that, but I would say just pick a different game yeah. if you're going to go that route. Yeah. Scalability? So... There's mechanical and gameplay, right? So mechanical, the number of action discs and the white discs varies based on player count. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with three and four players, there's an open information final scoring card. So kind of that house rule that we just talked about, that's already there at least partially Mm -hmm. in a less than five player game. Gameplay wise, for me at least, as with other area majority scorings, the game plays tighter and feels more interesting with more players. It is a little bit more chaotic because you have more actions that happen between your uh, ability to take actions, but it just, it feels better at the higher player counts. It does. It does for me as well. 
It's easier with fewer players for a single player to dominate a stack of actions and re-trigger their own actions so they get to, oh, hey, I get to take three of each yeah, yeah. now. That type thing with less players. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's fine with three. It's I think, fine, I, but I, I would... I think ra- I enjoy it with three. I, I would really, rather play it with higher, with I a agree. higher number. Yep, I totally agree with that. All right. So comments from BGG. So this this is a new game. It just came out at Essen, right, Mm -hmm. last week. So there's not a ton. But I did find a few here that I thought were at least warrant bringing up. So player actions and majority scorings alternate minute by minute in Kalimala. If you don't think ahead a few scorings, your preparation for powerful turns comes too late, while others have scored in the meantime with minimal effort. One of the more interesting releases of Spiel 2017, although of limited general appeal with the strong focus on majority scoring. Yeah, Yeah, I think that's that's pretty spot on. Mm -hmm. This would be the dissenting opinion here. (laughs) Absolutely nothing wrong with the mechanics. The action selection grid allows for setup of fancy future moves and well thought out actions. The scoring system is also okay. But my big nagging feeling is the game is so lacking of theme and flair that for me, it's really boring in the end. There's no more of a cube pusher than this one. I also found the scoring tiebreaker too strong. Even the art was rather dull. So Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. You know, but okay, so he found it dull, but he gave credit mm-hmm. to the main mechanism, which is the what is enticing right. about the game, right? Right. A wonderfully interactive action selection mechanism where you're half trying to do what you want, half trying to find places where you can leech off of other players' <laughs> actions. Exactly. Uh-huh. All right. So, summary. In a comment about the game, BGG user J-O-S-C-H, I don't know if it's Josh, said, Kalimala is a mix between tactical short-term scoring and long-term preparations. And I don't think I could say it any better than that. This is exactly what the game is and what makes it a cool experience to play. You have to plan for the next scoring tile, but you also have to plan for the next and the next and also for your in-game scoring card. So, wonderful first game from Fabio Lapiano. This game should be totally milk toast. It should be just completely forgettable and everything at just... Eh, I'm getting resources, I'm converting resources in area majority. Mm-hmm. Whee! <laughs> However, the mechanism that drives all of that is good enough, as I mentioned, to carry the game. And I am super excited that I have found a game now where a single mechanism can carry mm-hmm. a game enough to where I'm still excited to play it after seven, eight plays. I still want to play it some more. So I'm looking forward to seeing what comes next from Fabio. Well done on your first design. Absolutely, sir. So as far as a rating, so we rate on a one to six scale. One, burn it with fire. Six, Hall of Fame. And there's no middle of the road. It's either above average or below average. Mm -hmm. So, ma'am? This one was hard for me, but I would have to say... I have to say a four because it's, like you said, it's nothing insane. It's nothing mind-bending. It's nothing earth-shattering. But that mechanic is really, really cool. And that's what pushes it over for me from just a normal, just very average game. Yep. I have it as a four on that, that one or two, if you will, the 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 stacking mechanism and the kicking out mm-hmm. for the scoring uh, I enjoy the game enough for this to stay in our collection as a as a four rated game as a, a perfect hour long game yep. uh, while you're waiting for folks while you're ending the game or ending your game day a good I don't want to you know we have three or four of us here at the house but I don't want something super heavy this definitely kind of scratches a similar itch as a castles of Burgundy. yeah definitely so yeah that's Kalimala. All right, y'all, that's all we got for this week. So join us next week where it's going to be likely more S in goodness. <laughs> that's going to be that for a long time. Right. And seriously, uh, I again, I know I, I drove the point home on the front end of the show here, but just a massive thank you to everybody that has both taken the time to help us 
to be a part of the community. And for those that choose to help financially through Patreon or the annual patrons, uh, just thank you for helping a dream come true. And now it's just a matter of building upon that. And as I like to say, onward and upward, Absolutely. Team Heavy Cardboard, yep, us yep. and y'all. Yep. So thanks, y'all. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>